Well, welcome everybody to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Dotsie Bausch, and yes, I am here with my co-host Alexandra Paul. Hi, Alexandra. <laughs> Hi, Dotsie. So we get so many questions um, emailed in and uh, just asked in general to our faces, right? When we're we're, we're hanging out and we're at um, different events, you know, what's the best way to make the switch? for good? What's the best way to transition over? Or how can I help my friends and my family um, make the switch uh, without just yelling at them and telling them to stop immediately, right? Like, how uh, can that we... That doesn't work for No. <laughs> how can we be, um, you know, loving in the process, but but also really give people some tips that they can, you know, chew on and say, okay, this is a, these are, these are steps. Because we know that lifestyle change, um, it seems, you know, it's intimidating. Um, and it's, it's hard to remove certain um, foods that we've considered foods uh, for, you know, almost our entire life. Uh, it's, it's, it's not easy for people. And it's, it's, um, it doesn't have to feel like such a monumental shift, you know, it doesn't have to feel so big and overwhelming. So we have created uh, at Switch for Good kind of like this just easy five steps to help you make the switch over from um, dairy to all these amazing plant-based fuels that are out there. And the very first step that uh, really to me and, and others will argue with me, but I think is the most important step is that you you always need to state your why. Because I think if you don't have a uh, founded and heart-centered or soul-centered reason for why you want to do this, it's really hard to get off. It's really easy to get off track and really hard to stay on track. Because if you can't go back to really the core of why you're doing this in the first place, then it's just easy to say, nah, not today or not tonight or yeah. And so, and so don't just say, why am I doing this? Because uh, without, and just go with the first thing that mm -hmm. comes. Be that, sometimes your gut will tell you, but a lot of times we'll get too superficial. Like I want to lose 10 pounds or I want to lower my cholesterol. All mm -hmm. very valid reasons, but sometimes there's deeper reasons. So ask yourself after you've, a you've answered the first why, mm -hmm. um, I want to lower my cholesterol. A ask why do I want to lower my cholesterol? Nice. And then... You'll go because I want to be active in my seventies with my grandkids, and then you then you ask again. And social scientists have said you can go as deep as five whys, and a lot of times a fifth why you'll get really deep. You know that is super advice. Um, so you're you're the best at this. I mean, the you know the second which you're kind of alluding to now is setting a goal. What's the yeah. best way to set a goal? Set a small goal, and make it clear. Don't say I'm just going to eat less dairy. No, say exactly. How many, and it's better to put it in the positive and not how, what you're taking away, because that just makes you feel bad and, and, and um, like you're, you're being deprived. So just say, state a very uh, specific small goal, like for dinner three nights this week, I am going to have oat milk instead of cow's milk. Perfect. That's, okay, so that leads into number three, which is make a plan. And that yeah. that's that those are those are intermixed, right? Said if you set a specific enough goal, that yeah. is a plan. Do, do and do we want to set um, a short term plan and a long term term plan, or just a short term plan? Well, I think it. I think it's best to ha to have uh, make sure that the plan supports the goal. So if you're yeah. if you say something like you're you're moving towards getting rid of dairy, then go right. into your kitchen and take out. The dairy, because that's going to make it harder for Don't you. Leave it there, and to, make right. sure you buy the oat milk. So m decide when you're going to go to the store to actually fill up your refrigerator with oat mm -hmm. milk. Mm -hmm. And then number four is actually you know putting it into action, which yeah. is part of uh, what you're saying. But I, I think it's always really important to, as you're putting something into action, to allow yourself to celebrate that you're you've gotten this far and that you are putting it into action. Too often, if we uh, start something, if we go off the rails or we you know get derailed from it, we berate ourselves. But we don't celebrate when we you know stay on the rails and yeah. and and are putting something into action. So remember as you're putting it into action to kind of celebrate your actionable journey uh, in whatever that looks like, whether it's like a, you know, date with your, with, with Ian, right. Or, uh, you know, just an extra, um, little time off of work and walk in the park, like just, just do something that says, yeah, all right. Yay me. I accomplished this. Yeah. And also, so that's after you do the action, before you do the action, it often helps to write it down, commit to it by writing in your, in your calendar, <laughs> you know, 
oat milk tonight. <laughs> yeah, I know. So. I know if it's not my calendar, nothing happens. Right. So right. it has to. Um, and then uh, easily enough, step number five is just uh, rinse and repeat. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the like more you practice. do something, the more uh, engaged you'll become in doing it. It won't be as hard. You'll like it more. You've talked about losing your taste for the old foods and starting to love the new foods when you, um, and you can continue just to repeat. Don't, don't make my biggest bit of advice is don't make big steps, make little steps. Little steps consistently will Mm -hmm. yield much more in the end than one big step that you feel too overwhelmed to repeat the next week. Right. And then if you don't accomplish it, what happens? You give up. So so make the tiny steps. You give up because you blame yourself when really it was your system that was that was not right. Your system was too overwhelming. Yeah. I thought you were going to say sister, but it's our system. Okay. <laughs> we're not going to blame our sisters. If we, I like that though. That would be easy. <laughs> it would be easy except for my sister's a vegan, so it wouldn't work. <laughs> I can't blame her. <laughs> oh, we can blame anything we want. No. All right. Let's, uh, gosh, let's dive into the guest. Yes. So let's talk about money, specifically your money. Our guest today is part of the team that launched the world's first vegan index on the U.S. stock market, a ticker that will ensure your investments will only go towards cruelty-free and environmentally friendly companies, as well as divesting from companies with shadier standards. With over 30 years in the finance and investing industry, Claire Smith is using her expertise to influence positive change on a global scale. Whether you're still using a shoebox as a savings account or you check the stocks every day, this episode is a crucial listen. So, living in Europe, but now in New York City, (laughs) we have Claire Smith on the line. Hello, Claire. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And Dotsies, too. We're really excited to learn more about investing as a whole, but also specifically cruelty free investing. So Claire, let's break this down into layman's terms. Can you tell us what you actually created with this vegan index, which is called the U.S. Vegan Climate ETF? Certainly. Um, What we've created is an alternative to the main market benchmark that people use to access the uh, U.S. stock market. Everybody's obviously heard of the S&P 500, Um, And what we've done is we've taken the top 500 stocks out there and we've screened them according to our criteria. Uh, And we've kicked out some 225 stocks out of the top 500. We've put in a few in the mid caps that are adhering to our criteria and which do have a a vegan and environmentally friendly theme. Um, But basically it, it, it is really replacing the S&P 500 type of exposure that everybody has in their their pension funds, which is really the default way of accessing the market. Mm -hmm. But it's taking out all of those stocks which are undertaking animal exploitation, so that's testing animal products, fossil fuels, a lot of other stuff, plastics, pesticides, human rights abuses. So it's a very clean and green way of accessing the stock market. Mm -hmm. Can you take us through the rigorous selection process? What your you know you mentioned a few things that the companies <clears throat> make sure they don't have. But what 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 do you what do you what do you start with? You take a company. What what are you know? Is there a, a group of first things that you look at, and then if they green light past those, you go on to the next, or how do you select? Yeah, what I would say is that there are some things which are which are really pretty obvious. Um, and, uh, and those we can attack by, by simply looking at the um, categorization of the, of the company. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's quite obvious if something is a, a meat producer, it's mm-hmm. clearly not going to be welcome in the index. Um, but then there's, uh, there's a lot of companies that have very kind of mixed activities. Um, and also they may not be directly hurting animals, but their business model is is very tied to, to that industry. Mm. For example, we've, we've taken out some um, producers of uh, animal feed. So some companies whose main um, business is to produce the feed that is then given to the animals in the factory farm. So we see that as highly connected. Some um, companies that are creating equipment, which is used within dairy farms, let's, let's say, um, and any slaughterhouse equipment, those those types of, um, of of things. So it's not just the actual uh, companies that are raising the animals, but also that that entire ecosystem. Quite a lot of the consumer stocks get kicked out because they are selling the products of 
of you know um, slaughtered animals essentially um so that would be all of uh, a lot of food companies but also uh companies in in the retail space that are um selling more more clothing leather for example mm-hmm. um in animal testing we're looking across the whole span of animal testing that causes a number of pharmaceuticals companies to be knocked out because of preclinical trials which are mostly on what they call the animal model um, which means testing on animals themselves Um, but in addition to that there's quite a lot of other products that also do need to be um, tested some food substances some um, chemicals industrial type products Um, and so those also get uh, Get, those companies also get removed if they have been um, animal tested. Um, other than the animal products, we've got s- restrictions around other types of exploitation or, or harm to animals. So, for example, hunting, and we, we tend to also, we're excluding suppliers of, of hunting um, products, uh, uh, theme parks which have animals in captivity, for example, the um, and uh, other types of things like gen- genetic modification of animals. So those those are some of the animal animal screens. And we, as I said, we do go into quite a lot of uh, detail on that, not just looking at the direct um, exposure, but also companies whose business models really rely on on um, on on that. And what what are the plans? Like, how often are you reviewing these companies' ethics? I, I know especially for cosmetic companies, you know, they may not be testing in the U.S., but the second they start selling to China, that requires it. Um, is this a monthly review, a weekly review of, of these companies that you've selected and their practices? Or, Well, we're mm-hmm. constantly reviewing the companies. So we're constantly keeping on top of what, what they are doing in their, in their um, activities. Um, but in terms of how the index changes, it has a six-monthly rebalance. So a formal review is done every six months. And this is basically because um, the top 500 stocks are changing all the time. I mean, you know, the top 400 probably don't change very much. But as you get down to the bottom, some companies drop out, some companies are rising, their stock prices are moving up. And so they become eligible to be in in the uh, in the index by virtue of being in the top 500 so that process of the stock market moving means that we have to do a review every six months and we also are doing a review according to our criteria um in 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 the same with the same schedule so that the index itself will change every every six months. There'll be a turnover of probably about 20 or so stocks, I would think. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, this is going to be a little bit of uh, Finance 101. <clears throat> the S&P, what is the S&P 500? Is it all the stocks in the stock market? It's just in a s- certain market, right? It's the, it's the 500 stocks in a certain market, and your vegan climate exchange traded fund is only um, trading in that market. It's not in, in Tokyo, or is it? No, that's right. The okay. S&P 500 is a U.S. stock market index. So the, U- the S&P 500 takes the 500 top stocks in the U.S. Um, and so that is our, our base uh, or benchmark or base exposure that we're, we're looking at as being the, the kind of what I said, the kind of default exposure to the U.S. stock market, basically because it covers, the S&P 500 actually covers some 80% of the total stock market in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Okay, so was, it's not to say that there aren't only 500 stocks. There's about, I don't know, three or 4,000 in total. But once you get below the 500, you're really getting into smaller and smaller. We're not, taking the 500. We're also adding in some stocks from the uh, mid-cap, which are more oriented towards plant-based and renewable energy to replace some of the things that we're taking out. Um, But once you get into, you know, beyond to 85%, you know, everything gets really, really tiny. And so there's really no point putting them them in. It wouldn't have that much impact on, on the portfolio at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I was thinking a lot of companies that are, well, a lot of the smaller vegan companies aren't traded, so they wouldn't be able to be included. But mm-hmm. even a company like yeah. Beyond Meat, is that company in the top 500 stocks traded? Is it big mm-hmm. enough? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, actually, it's not yet, but it is in our index. Uh, we added in it in cap. because um, it, it does more speak to um, the uh, the. Um, 
the, 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 the point of the index, which is to be forward looking, be bringing in those companies into the index ahead of time, not that it needs to wait until it gets into the 500 in order to be acceptable. Um, in our index. And the reason that we're doing that is because we are taking out so much in the food sector that we are looking for these other smaller stocks in order to bring them into the index. Not that we're going to remedy, we're not going to be able to cover all of the uh, exposure that we're taking out, but at least we'd like them to be in there so that if they grow, people do have the benefit of them. And, we, and we're looking for more companies to, to bring in um, uh, as, you know, as soon as more IPO or if if uh, we find more companies that would address that sector exposure, we will we will put uh, we will put more of them in, provided they are obviously plant based and they don't have any animal animal products. We find that there are some really really tiny ones, but they're really not worth putting in because they would be such a small amount and they don't trade. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a bit of a it bit, it's a bit of a problem that the big food companies are all very much oriented towards meat, dairy, fish. And they, they do need to uh, to change their operations more towards a, a plant-based uh, model it, and uh, not just to be eligible for our index, but because we think that that's going to be great for the world overall. That's that's the whole point of what we're doing is mm -hmm. to move things in a better direction. Well, so once you take the company through this um, ethics filter, um, do you do any um, quantitative analysis within the fund? And if so, what me methods do you guys use? Okay, yeah, we are doing quantitative analysis, and that analysis is primarily around the the uh, environmental impact. We, we're also assessing the social and governance impact as well. So the carbon footprint is reduced by some 60%, the waste by some 89%, and the water consumption by some 83%. So broadly speaking, I say... If you keep your money in the S&P, your carbon footprint is actually two and a half times as much as it needs to be. Your mm. waste footprint is uh, some 10 times as much as it needs to be. And your water consumption is five times as much as it needs to be. Those are easier figures to, to, um, to remember. Uh, and we, we think that's the case, basically, because we're providing essentially what is a very, very similar exposure in terms of risk and reward space as the S&P 500. But you're reducing this carbon waste and water footprint down considerably. And I think that that is, is going to be, for, you know, for people who care about the environment, I think they don't want to feel that their needs in terms of investment returns are compromising our ability to live on the planet. Uh, an impact portfolio of, of companies which is uh, investing in um, startups, uh, seed capital, early stage for plant-based businesses. So we are across the platform trying to both allow people to take money out and also creating programs which uh, which will hopefully you know create the big the, the beyond meets of the of future some investors can invest in those types of companies it depends on how much money you have your risk tolerance etc mm -hmm. but if we're helping create these companies they we hope will also go onto the stock market IPO we'll be able to buy them in our public equities portfolios as well so is that the vegan climate fund that you've had for several years and you've been able to track it to see how well it's doing? Because um, that's a powerful argument for investing in your ETF, your new ETF, your new U.S. vegan climate exchange trade fund, to have had this other uh, portfolio of vegan companies and, and see how they've done over the years. I'm very pleased with the way that that portfolio um, is is performing um, in respect of the U.S. Vegan Climate Index. It has been live, calculated live since June 2018, so a year, um, and that was when we created the rules and we basically set it off. And it's just been monitoring what the market is doing, uh, creating the index, calculating the value of the index on a daily basis based on. The, num the prices of all the stocks which are in that index. And so it's a really, really good representation of how the fund will perform. Before we created the index, we obviously did do some testing. We didn't want to s release some kind of a product that really wasn't going to um, you know, 
give investors anything new or interesting or that wasn't going to be valuable to them. Um, and so we did the testing. We were very satisfied with the with the results. Obviously, that we we would we would not have done it had we not felt that it was uh, it was going to um, you know provide people with with something that they uh, that they could rely on um, as a savings product. Um, and that, that would also address address these concerns um, in terms of the animals, the climate, um, and uh, and these uh, environmental footprints that I discussed earlier. You do have uh, you have higher fees than a lot of other um, funds. Uh, yes, unfortunately, we're not um, well. <laughs> Like Vanguard or Fidelity, we don't have billions and billions of dollars under management yet. Um, yes. If the assets of the of the ETF do go up, then we'll be more than happy to to reduce the fees. But we are conscious of the fact that we do have to pay our service providers, and that is uh, you know a hurdle that does need to be overcome in the short term. We are also producing something which is a sort of off uh, a, sh- a very easily accessible product for people at a lower price than you'll be able to do it yourself or, or with uh, with the help of another manager. Normally, um, if you wanted a manager to put together this kind of bespoke mandate, you would generally be paying over 1%. And the manager would probably, in order to be, you know, to want to be bothered to do all of this work that we've mm-hmm. done, um, would probably say, oh, well, I mean, I'm, I need you to give me some 5 million or more um, because otherwise it's not worth my effort to go to this uh, um, you know, to, to not worth my time to go to the effort of, of researching all of these stocks. Mm-hmm. So this is a lot of work. It's not work that anybody's really um, done before or tried to bring anything like this to market. And so at the moment, it is maybe a boutique product, a bit a bit of a niche product. But if if there is interest in it and the assets go up, then we will certainly be bringing the, the, the fees down because our hope and intention is to bring this style of investing to the widest possible um, uh, public um, because we think that it, it addresses the needs of many, many people. Arguably, the number of vegans in the world, you know, you've got different figures, different places, one to five percent. It's definitely increasing. It's increasing amongst the young. And so the, the population that want this kind of product is increasing. And so we have we have high hopes for it for the future. Mm-hmm. What was your inspiration to create this index in the first place? Well, I mean, it was a personal pain point in a way. Um, I, some 10 years ago, um, I think it was, I uh, had moved to uh, Switzerland. I was previously located in the UK um, and I had worked in uh, banks in the city of London. And um, those banks had paid into a pension fund and they had still got hold of my pension fund at that point. Um, and I really didn't know what they were doing with it. Um, and, uh, and had, you know, I, I, or how it was performing or whether they were inv- even investing it properly at all, because I had left those banks some years before and I was now in another country. So I got in touch and said, Oh, you know, can I move this? And apparently I could. And so I ended up taking it away from that bank and putting it into, um, a, a structure, um, and then I had to think about how, I, how it should be managed. I went to an asset manager. They put a fairly standard allocation together. I looked through, you know, I knew what the index components were. I was not happy about the fossil fuel exp- exposure, animal testing, all of the things that are in this product, essentially all of those things I was not happy about having any, anything to do with. And I had to really search around to find any kind of product, that investment product that that I felt comfortable to put into this my own pension plan, um, and there really and there wasn't anything. There was nothing that really fit the bill, um, and so that was really the germ of the idea: is how how would I put together something that people could put their pension fund into? And I'm not suggesting that people should put 100 percent of their pension fund into this one product, this U.S. large cap product. Usually, a pension allocation would have some. Um, you know, uh, fixed income, some bonds for the security of, of, of that, um, some different markets. Maybe you have the U.S., but maybe you have some exposure to international. And so my vision, that, however, is to build out this entire platform so that people can 
invest in a much broader way. They can put their pension fund into these different um, buckets, um, and uh, but still keep everything within this whole kind of cruelty-free um, ethos. That's fantastic, and I, I just think you you're a pioneer, uh, and in such a hard-boiled place as Wall Street, um, it's really really important that economically, uh, veganism, plant-based living, be shown to be successful, because mm-hmm. then we'll get a whole other demographic. Mm-hmm. That we never got because everyone still thinks that people who are vegan plant slash plant based are just uh, dirty hippies. I think vegans generally are an underserved market in terms of the financial services, and so yeah, maybe they are under invested than most people mm. um, because they they've not wanted to touch it because they were they were afraid that they were mm-hmm. going to be putting their money into something, and so they've tended to sort of like edge away and not really want too much to do with it. So we are getting some people who are contacting us saying, "Look, I've never invested." Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, how do they, I go about this? That's great. Mm-hmm. Well, what kind of uh, challenges have you come up against, or maybe some of your old comrades from some of the other banks, their opinions on what you're doing? Has there been much pushback, or are, are people giving you a thumbs up? Go for it. Um, I, I, yeah, I think overall, um, overall, the, the the response has actually been quite uh, quite positive. I would say some people are. Yeah, there's there's the usual trolls. Um, right. <laughs> sad to say, you know. Every well, I think every time anybody does anything new, people will there'll always be detractors. There'll always mm-hmm. be criticism, and some people. Um, I, I mean, I see it less and less actually, but uh, you know, some people are just gen- a little bit anti-vegan, and maybe are triggered by the fact that it's got the word vegan in the um, in the uh, in the title. Mm-hmm. But um, it really, I mean, vegan really does explain the ethos of it very well because, you know, the definition of veganism is just avoiding exploitation of animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose. That That is literally what it is. And that's what we're trying to build in to the, um, that's what we've built into the investment uh, process. It's not just about, oh, well, we'll just kick out a few meat companies and kick out a few um fast food restaurants or something in order to just do something a little bit sort of lightweight or, um, you know, half, half baked, we're really delving deep into what's going on in the companies and, uh, and, and, and how, how they're, how they're, they're supporting these, these, uh, um, damaging businesses and whether their support is really, you know, going too, too far and, and, and helping those businesses carry on when, and maybe, maybe they, uh, they should be throwing in the towel. Uh, your is it called the ticker number? What is the your yeah? Is V that's right. Is V V E G N? Mm-hmm. Yeah, is the ticker. So you so don't shy every, away from the word vegan at all, which is which is no, ex- no, because no, exactly. No, no, I've just just gone for it. Whatever. We're going to reclaim it. I don't. You know, there's, there's as I said, there's a certain anti-vegan sentiment, and you know, and people say it in a derogatory way, and I just I just want to you know reclaim it and say you know vegan loud and proud. You know, so. Um, V-E-G-N, it had to be four letters because that fits into the stock exchange system uh, in, in terms of what, what, the, what the code is for each company. So each company has a, has a code of up to four letters. And so that was the closest we could get to the word vegan. I think it's perfect. Yeah, me too. I think it's great. So um, tell us about you and how you first became vegetarian and then went vegan and why this is such a passion for you. Yes. Uh, well, it, it, it's really been um, uh, entirely constant throughout my adult life. Um, I made the decision when I was uh, 15 years old to go vegetarian. And that was the, the first step that most people take. And, and that in itself at that time was, was an unusual thing. Um, this was in the late 1970s, in fact. Um, and as, as such, um, I did that from an ethical standpoint because I had become aware of, um, A, animals being killed in order to sort of, you know, land up on the plate in front of me. Um, and also I was becoming aware that the process by which farming was being done was becoming more industrialized. Um, and that was something that really dis- disturbed me a great deal. And so that continued for about 20 years. And then I had uh, I had a baby. And, uh, and two things around about that time, obviously, I was nursing uh, my baby, and I just found it to be 
you know, just a wonderful experience to be nourishing this little baby. And um, and a, a kind of like a little light bulb went off in my head when I thought about cows and, and goat and sh- goats and sheep and other t- other animals like them that that are that are used for for milk. I thought, hmm, this this isn't this is not right. Um, and the other thing that weirdly happened was that my daughter was found to be lactose intolerant. It started a, a, some research around how milk basically um, is, is, it does not do a, go- a body good, which is the marketing. Um, and, uh, and I actually found that there were some quite major um, uh, negatives around drinking milk. I actually had had a lot of problems with my sinuses and, and, uh, and colds and, and, and such, and some occasionally asthma. And I looked at this re- research around milk. And I thought, well, do you know, maybe that's that's all part of it. So I stopped drinking milk then, and I also researched eggs somewhat as well, and removed that. And and then there, you know, and lo and behold, I was I was vegan. <laughs> I've been really strict vegan for uh, for many years now, um, uh, and and just just to try and make sure that wherever I'm going, there is something that, 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 that I can eat. Mm-hmm. And you have um, th- this fund launched in the beginning of September, and it, it launched about 25 a share. Um, I want to hear from you before you go, what's the outlook that you see for investors in, in 12, 24, or even in the future 60 months from now? Our fund will, I wouldn't say it will track exactly the market, because that then there wouldn't be so much purpose in it. But the purpose of it is to avoid these companies. And there is a very good reason to avoid these companies. These companies are, frankly, broken business models. Um, Fossil fuels, animal agriculture are the beneficiary of quite a lot of subsidy by the government. Mm. And without that subsidy, they they wouldn't exist. Um, Without... um, the, the, the fairly, well, with, with the regulations, which may well be coming in with changes in terms of people's con- consumption and uh, also with uh, things like the carbon tax, those those kind of uh, and meat taxes, etc. The, the prospects for these companies are not looking good. Right. And so there is investment risk in holding them. So in terms of our, um, our product is not taking those risks. And if you're not taking a risk, then you're not going to suffer the downside of uh, if, if those risks turn out to, to come to fruition. And these um, companies do find it difficult to do business, do see their revenues for, are left with stranded assets. I mean, the, the climate situation, I'm sitting here in New York with the climate week going on. The climate situation is so incredibly severe that... Um, there will have to be a moratorium on burning fossil fuel at some point. Mm-hmm. So apparently some hundred trillion, I heard this number, I, I hope I misremembered it, but some hundred trillion of fossil fuel assets exist on the balance sheets of oil companies. Now, those assets are worth precisely zero if they can't be so, uh, if they, if that if that oil can't be sold, it can't be burnt. It's useless. It is just you know stuff that's sort of under the under the earth's crust and, and of, of, of of no value the it, oil only has only had a value for basically the last 200 years since it was possible to drill to get it out to burn it in order to create power if we can't burn it anymore it goes back to having value of, of zero i look at things like the cafos i look at the um, you know the big uh, farms uh, you know cafo the, these installations in minnesota the north carolina um, pig farms, etc., and I don't see a value for those if they are not being used to raise animals. They're maybe in the middle of nowhere. They're heavily polluted now. That land has very, very little value in itself. It only has value to the extent that they have these installations. So there's a stranded assets issue there um, around those installations, and also possibly there's a stranded assets issue around. Um, some of the animal feed, because if the if the, the animals don't exist to eat all of this feed, you've got potentially some grain companies which are left with land that uh, you know is is far in excess of what humans need to be able to to feed themselves. Mm-hmm. We're feeding seventy odd billion 
animals and then saying we can't feed them feed 10 billion humans People. makes no sense to me. right so specifically for VEGN it opened around 25 a share right am I correct on that mm. so I was interested it's still around in, that level yeah exactly I was interested in your outlook for VEGN for people that want to invest what the mm-hmm. outlook is that you see in 12 months from now or in even 60 months from now for people that are have heard this podcast and go okay I'm going to look into this um well um yeah um I'm sorry I could have been been clearer, but in the um, in 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 respect of how I see it performing against the general market, mm-hmm. I think there are very good reasons to um, think that it could outperform because it's avoiding some of these big negatives, um, the negatives around fossil fuel, the negatives around animal agriculture. I I see people moving more plant based, literally in their daily lives and eating. What, what, what is necessarily healthier. Um, and that could be a negative for pharmaceutical uh, manufacturers who are relying on selling drugs to people for um, pain relief, a lot of which is to do with inflammation, which is heavily associated with the consumption of meat, and also chronic diseases. And if you, you look at um, um, some, some books like Dr. Greger's book about uh, um, the 15 main causes of premature death and chronic disease. He he can, he points to research which shows that eating meat and dairy has has a lot to do with with uh, many of those, and that a plant based diet will reduce the incidence of um, would would ne- then reduce the incidence of those. He recommends that people who uh, some of the more enlightened doctors are recommending that for people with diabetes. So if that cures, re- you know, reduces the incidence of these diseases, then then the pharmaceuticals manufacturers do not have the the same kind of ready audience for for their drugs, and of course they're they're a, you know they're part of the group that we exclude for animal animal testing as mm-hmm. well. Plastics manufacturers we're reducing. How many countries now are putting a, a moratoriums on single use uh, plastic? France, I think, uh, did it quite recently. Many countries around the, around the world have uh, banned um, plastic plastic bags. So I see this as all part of a societal shift. We put it, you know, in these exclusions, the, the you know, we're, we're basically riding what is a, a kind of a tidal wave of consumer support for a much more sustainable lifestyle. And so the country, the companies that have been producing these things, which are unsustainable, are going to run into problems. We don't have them in our index. Thank and I you. think that's the, really the main point is avoiding those kind of, those risks and hence, um, uh, you know, reducing your 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 potential for um, suffering losses through their their business models um, basically breaking down. Thank you so much. That was a. I think that explained why it's important to invest in these more future-looking funds instead of the ones that are just wanting to get a quick buck in the next month. Right. So thank you so much, Claire, for being on our show. And for people interested in finding you, uh, can you tell us where they could find you at Beyond Investing? Yes. Beyond Investing has its own website, which is www.beyondinvesting.com. And that's the advisor site, which tells you uh, tells people about the uh, our general approach, who we are, why we're doing this, and, and, and what the philosophy of the firm is. Um, the specific site for the, um, and it does talk about the index as well. The specific site for the ETF, um, it has its own site, which is www.veganetf.com. Um, and, uh, and that gives, again, uh, some description about the, uh, the index, the ETF. It has a beautiful film on it, uh, which you can watch, which uh, we produce, which tells you, you know, why, why, we're, why we're doing this, what mm-hmm. we, our intention is, which is that we should be able to invest for a kinder, cleaner and healthier world. Um, and, uh, and then all of the necessary information about the returns, the dividends, all those kind of financial statistics, etc., all at the bottom. Um, so you can look that up and uh, you can direct your broker to it or with that information you, you can um, figure out how to, how to get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much appreciated. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. 
And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.